the 2010 International Transport Forum in Leipzig. Transport and innovation, unleashing the potential. Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're vitalized by that music and those great innovative graphics. You're here to um, unleash business, innovation, getting down to business in the next uh, uh, three and a half hours. And uh, my job is to make sure that this becomes as productive as possible. My name is Nick Gowing. Um, and uh, we're going to go uh, through a number of, a couple of statements, first of all, but then we're going to go into what is essentially a brainstorming mode uh, up until uh, the final uh, plenary remarks from uh, the head of Lufthansa just before lunch. And uh, you all do part on hopefully very efficient transport systems from here in Leipzig. And John Micklethwaite is here from The Economist as well for the opening keynote. But first of all, to Rob Merriman, who's uh, State Secretary for Transport uh, from the Canadian Presidency. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to just uh, tell you a little bit about what happened yesterday and a little recap it for you. We had a, a meeting of the ministers. Uh, I don't know if that's a meeting of the minds. That's really all about uh, we're from the government. We're here to help. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, that's our, our line as ministers, and I'm not sure it uh, sells that well, but we did want to talk about uh, uh, transportation. One of the things that were brought up there was uh, that all transport, uh, first of all, we want to make it a happy experience. Uh, and that's why we say uh, we're from the government, we're here to help, so that uh, when we talk about the public, the masses, and I know we have experts, and I know we have policymakers, and I know we have uh, people from our departments here, but the, we live in a world where we uh, deal with the public on a day-to-day -day basis, and so we see things from perhaps a little uh, a different perspective on things. But we did talk about railways. Uh, and the importance of railways, the importance of high-speed rail. Uh, we've also talked, and uh, there were some comments with regard to that about some of the downsides to, or downsides to uh, high-speed rail, uh, particularly battery prices and so on. So uh, there were comments around that. We talked about the importance of uh, storing energy, the importance of ports and shipping, uh, some of the technology, uh, new technology of laser uh, technology that is being implemented in, in some of our ports and some of our shipping uh, uh, areas. Uh, planes, we talked about standardizing regulations, uh, making sure that when we uh, deal with uh, aircraft transportation that we do it together uh, globally, that we make sure that one country doesn't get uh, uh, a leg up on another, I believe that's uh, something that we all are concerned about when we talk about public-private partnershiping and some of the upsides and some of the limitations of, of that uh, way of raising money and building infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to cars and truck traffic and congestion, there was a lot of discussion on, on standardizing emissions, uh, making sure that it's done uh, globally. That, uh, that uh, we uh, deal with congestion in some unique ways and some, uh, some of the thoughts were uh, moving off of peak time so that we have people uh, traveling in and out of our congested cities at off peak times and uh, ways of being able to do that, uh, perhaps working uh, longer into the evenings and earlier in the mornings so that we can take advantage of the infrastructure in a much better way. Uh, talking about GPS, wireless, uh, the technology of information, all of those and more. That's what we talked about in a very short time period with a, uh, with a very informal uh, dialogue back and forth between uh, all of our countries in, uh, in a session that actually uh, I believe uh, was very productive. We brought uh, forward uh, many of these ideas and put them on the table in a very, uh, uh, a very uh, uh, sort of open way. And I uh, appreciated all of the ministers uh, being engaged in that process. We're here talking about innovation. Innovation sometimes is a very broad perspective and it's, uh, you can get kind of trapped in the ideology of innovation. Uh, we, want to, uh, we want to land it a little bit, uh, making sure that we understand exactly what we're talking about and some of the areas that we're uh, moving into and uh, some of the potential opportunities that are there. One thing that we know is that we have to work together uh, from one uh, part of this globe to another. 
we, we have to do it in conjunction with one another, making certain that uh, uh, we have everyone's best interest in mind and that we can achieve uh, amazing things. And I want to, uh, as we close the session, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of uh, the challenges that we left uh, you at the beginning of this session and then how we ended up uh, at the end. But I do. Uh, I do want to just report to you, uh, we had a wonderful day in the Minister's session. We had a, a great uh, dialogue with regard to some of the innovations that are happening around the world in our respective countries. And we all can learn and we can all put those best practices to use in some ways. And if we take a, a nugget of uh, uh, information that we got in yesterday, either in the sessions or in the ministerial sessions, uh, back to our respective countries and use them in appropriate ways, we all end up winners. So. With that, uh, thank you very much. Rob Merrifield, thank you very much indeed. Let's move on for, to Jack Short. Uh, Jack, uh, you've brought all of us together here, um, and we need some kind of assessment of how we're doing, uh, where you think we're going, uh, and what the impact is so far based on the discussions. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you've all recovered from the dinner and the longest bar in Leipzig. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words on a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, a general point. I mean, this forum is meant to be a forum where we bring together all sorts of different groups and actors, and I think we have done that. Uh, three years ago, when we started having these forums, uh, we, we came from a position where we had a closed session of ministers. And that's all we did. We spent five or six hours with ministers, and we didn't engage with anybody else. And the idea, for example, that there would be somebody protesting outside about a big truck would have terrified me. Now, we, I see it now uh, as part of an engagement, part of a discussion. And Mr. Marmy is here, Mr. Lackney is here. They know how controversial their truck was, but actually I welcome the truck and I welcome the fact that we had somebody protesting about it because it's a debate and that's what we're here for, is a debate. Uh, we have 50 countries, 52 countries. We can't expect that you get them to agree on everything. They're so different in where they start from, in the way they think about things, that it's not our objective to make them agree to things. So when the press asks me, you know, what, what did you agree on? I, I will talk about that a little min in a few minutes. But we're not actually trying to twist their arms to agree to something. It's really to bring the actors together, to bring people together, to talk about things and to think about things. And I think we've done that by having you know, all the different interests here, uh, on the industry side, on the government side, inventors, we've had inventors, we've had kind of dreamers and thinkers, we've had intellectuals, we've had, I shouldn't say this, the ministers, implying that they're perhaps not intellectuals, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but I think, I think we are starting to achieve this aim of having a forum where everybody is together. And and talks about things and we try to push the agendas forward and that's why our moderators were sort of under instructions to, to push things forward to see where there's agreement to see where there's conclusion but nobody's going to be beaten up if they don't uh, join the consensus and I think that's the kind of place we want to be in so I think well you will judge it you will be invited for your views on it but uh, we would welcome your feedback too but we think that's where we want to be uh, Minister Merfield was a bit modest about the ministerial session yesterday because it's hard when you have 50 ministers in a circle from different countries, different backgrounds, different language skills, uh, different length of time as a minister. And actually he managed to, if you mind me saying so, minister, a very lively discussion going. And uh, what was good about it was that the ministers put forward lots of things to think about, ideas to think about. Uh, just a few examples. I mean, they're so different. You know, Mr. Uh, Leuenberger from Switzerland talked about his, the longest tunnel in the world. So it's a really strong emphasis of Swiss policy to get traffic off the road onto the road. So they're just about to open or finish the digging of a 57-kilometer tunnel. So that's a fantastic piece of transport infrastructure. Uh, Japan and Korea mentioned the Maglev, you know, a, a possible new technology. Incredibly expensive, but nevertheless, they're talking about it. 
uh, Australia and the Netherlands mentioned, you know, the problem we have with capacity on our network, and yet that the network is used all the time. So how should we, how could we use that better? And the idea, well, we're moving towards a 24-hour economy. Use the roads more at night. Move the starting time for schools or jobs or, or work and so on. So all sorts of ideas coming outside the transport sector, but that affect us. The U.S. Uh, talked about a whole new basis for airspace management that they want to go into. Sweden said, you know, we've got to keep improving safety. We've got to start making our cars and our idea to stop people drinking and driving come closer together. Put alkalox on cars. Now, it's not agreed in every country, but nevertheless, the ideas are out there. So there were lots of ideas fizzing around like that, and I think that's, that's exactly what we intend to do. Uh, as formal output from the session, uh, we have key messages from the forum, and these are available here, and these take you through the vision for transport to be all the perfect things we'd like transport to be in 2050, uh, to how we might get there. And it's drawn up for the ministers, and it's a formal output uh, that ministers uh, noted yesterday. We also are issuing today a, le a lengthier uh, paper from the Secretariat side, uh, a more developed piece on the same kind of ideas, and that's also available out there. This takes you through the various uh, kind of concepts of innovation, uh, the role of government, and leads us on at the end to what we want to do today is that the challenges in transport are complex, they involve many actors, and we need to find new ways of bringing these actors together uh, in new kinds of partnerships, and I think that's what we're going to try and talk about today. So I think the last part of this paper does set out these ideas that you know, transport is something that goes much broader than just the ministries of transport, and that we need to involve all sorts of other actors and engage with them and find new ways of doing it. And I think, Nick, that's what you're going to be doing this morning. So thank you very much for your attention. These papers and indeed others are outside and understand you're most welcome to go and get them. So thank you very much. Jack, Minister, thank you very much indeed. Um, now comes the work. And what is needed is some kind of catalyst to get you thinking over the horizon. And John Micklethwaite, who's editor of The Economist, is joining us uh, to give us the keynote uh, presentation because of his expertise in globalization, the speed at which things are changing at the moment, which is going to underpin the, the two hours of discussion we'll have before Wolfgang Mayruber joins us as well. John uh, is, uh, has written particularly on the issues of globalization, both um, the advantages and the challenges. And in this very fast-moving world at the moment, it's about somehow putting an anchor down. And uh, I can think of no one better, John, than you, to come and share with us your thinking to promote and provoke discussion, and you'll be joining the discussion afterwards. John. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, Jack and Colin and, 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 and Rob as well. Um, I'm going to begin with two health warnings. Um, the first is that I am not an expert in transport. My first decision as a rational adult investor was to buy shares in Eurotunnel, and that, I think, speaks for itself. The second warning is that I'm going to try, slightly as Nick implied, to try to provoke, to try to start a conversation. Why do you need to warn about that? Because if, like me, you spend a lot of time following politicians around, whenever they, start about trying, whenever they talk about trying to start a conversation, you know that is a sign of something monumentally vacuous about to appear. Each time Gordon Brown used it during the British election, one sensed impending doom. But in this case, it's a genuine attempt. I'm going to try and provoke by trying to start almost from the other end, I think, to many of the people in this room. I'm going to start from what I think is arguably the two biggest debates in the world at the moment. The first is coming from a business perspective, 
has to do with the nature of innovation, whether once again it's changing in a more dramatic way than it has done for the previous 30 years. And the second is from a political perspective about the role of the state. So I'm going to come from that end rather than particularly from transport, but I am going to argue that these two debates, one to do with business, the other to do with politics, are linked, and that one of the places where they could clash most aggressively is actually in transport. Let's begin with innovation, the title of what you're, you've, you've got on the, on the screen. Well, every company on the earth at the moment claims that it is an innovative company. Every government claims that it is a cradle of innovation. But I think something different is happening now. And first, I want to define what I mean by innovation. Most people in the West, I think, tend to think of breakthrough products embodied in revolutionary new things that are taken up by the elites and eventually trickle down to the masses. You think of gadgets like the iPad or the iPhone or maybe the GPS machines which we now have in our cars. But many of the most important innovations, I would argue, are firstly centred around incremental improvements aimed at the much wider bottom bits of the pyramid. Look at Walmart's supply chain um, system. Or look at Dell's application of just-in-time production to personal computers. But the really big thing in innovation are much bigger even than that. They're to do with when a whole system, a whole theory of how you produce those exciting new ideas comes about. Now, I think the easiest way to set the scene for what I think is now happening is to actually go back 30 years ago, to go back to Detroit. Back then, America's car companies sort of woke up almost to discover that Japan's car companies had overtaken them. And their bigger shock, however, was when they tried to find out why that had happened. And when they went to Japan, they discovered it wasn't, as they'd kept on telling the American government, all to do with the fact that the Japanese had cheaper hands, uh, the, uh, the cheaper workers, and it wasn't just to do with government subsidies. It was something completely different. It was a system of management. While Detroit had been sleeping, Japan had transformed itself from a low-wage economy into a hotbed of business innovation. They had created what we now call lean production, workers split into teams, each taking responsibility of what they did. And this swept around the world. Soon every factory, pretty much, was either lean or is out of business. Now, business gurus are always glibly proclaiming some form of revolution or other, but this really counted, I think, just as the advent of mass production, Henry Ford, did 100 years ago. Now, the interesting thing why this makes, I think, big difference to what's happening at the moment is I think something similar is beginning to happen in the developing world, led by India and China. Look around the industry and business there. You're beginning to see people coming up with products and services that are dramatically, dramatically cheaper than their Western equivalents. You've got $3,000 cars, $300 computer computers, and $30 mobile phones that offer services at nationwide service for just two cents a minute. All the elements of modern business, all the things we're all used to in the West, are being rethought from supply chain management to recruitment to retention. Emerging countries are now just becoming hotbeds of innovation. Why is this shift happening? Well, in part, it's to do with Western companies going across there because that's where the brains are. They're doing ever more research in emerging markets. IBM already employs more people in emerging markets than it does in America. If you look at companies in the Fortune 500, they have 98 R&D facilities in China and 63 in India. But I think it's also because emerging market firms and consumers are both moving up market. In 2006, there are only 16 companies from the BRICS, from Brazil, Russia, India, and China, in the Financial Times Global 500. Now they're 62. Look at banks. Between a quarter and a half of the value of the banking industry is now in what we used to think of the emerging world. Perhaps that's not surprising, given our competence in that particular area. But you look again and again at industries. Look at forging, where you find India's Bharat Forge. You look at batteries. You see China's BYD. You see Brazil's Embraer and jet aircraft. You're repetitively finding people coming up with new ways of doing stuff. Which company 
um, uh, applied for more international patents than any other in 2008? The answer is Huawei, a Chinese telecoms giant. The world's most innovative car. I think you could probably claim that was Tata's Nano. All the big Western companies have got factories around the developing world. They all have access to the same cheap hands, the same cheap workers. But what was different about Tata was it went out and rethought completely how you to redesign a car. That means you don't end up with just a $10,000 car, you end up with a $3,000 car. You have to rethink the whole process. And this, I think, this beginnings of revolution, which is patchy, I think you're going to see that increase dramatically. And the main reason why is because the emerging world is where the brains are, to put it brutally. Five million people each year are graduating from Chinese universities, three million from India, Fine, you might say, that isn't the same as Harvard, they're not the same as the Sorbonne, but 75,000 people are coming out with higher degrees in computer science or engineering in China, 60,000 in India. If you don't think this is real, go and talk to somebody like Bill Gates, and he'll explain why Microsoft's research facility at Beijing is pretty close to overtaking its one in Redmond. There is something big happening, and this is coming, I think, fundamentally to the, the core of the OECD countries you are going to see exactly the same response that you did to the Japanese 20, 30 years ago. You will see plenty of Western companies starting to cry for help as this wave of what people call frugal innovation comes to our countries. And it's going to make it much harder, frankly, for people like myself who wander around the world defending globalization when we talk to Western workers, because we have always maintained, well, it, it doesn't matter. Yes, you know, the emerging worlds do very well, but we will hang on to the smart jobs. Well, increasingly, I think the evidence is that that's not true. That doesn't, by any means, I should rapidly add, mean that globalization is a bad thing. Innovation is not a zero-sum game. We all get cheaper goods and services, and the machine pushes on. This is something we all win from, but the argument is going to be much harder to make, I think. What does this mean for transport? Well, it certainly means that Indian Chinese cars will come to us. You see airlines, you'll see aircraft manufacturers. You've already seen it a lot in shipping. There are already, I think, frugal production successes. I mentioned Tata's car. You could, I mentioned Embraer as well. What about the core of transport? Well, when I looked at it over the past week, I don't think that lean miracle, I talked about that frugal production, model has really reached it at first sight. Certainly if you look at India, if any of you here think you have problems with roads, railways or airports, then I suggest you imagine your, your colleagues in, in, the, in the subcontinent. India, I think, surged despite its infrastructure. China is certainly building roads, railways and airports at a speed many of you in this room would envy, but I don't think that really has much to do with efficiency. It's purely to do with the fact that it has a government which is much, much more able to tell people to get out of the way to help them build these things. It's more to do with autocracy than it is to do with fundamental new methods. But I do think this wave of frugal innovation I'm talking about is hitting areas very close to transport. The first neighbouring area is infrastructure generally, and particularly telecoms. I was interested to see that you've been talking about wireless technology and grids and things like that. Talking to, to the head of one of the, Western, one of the Western world's biggest telecoms companies the other day, he insisted that the two people who are now leading his industry were first Huawei, the Chinese company I talked about, and secondly, Bharti Airtel of India. That's a cell phone company that has completely changed the way that cell phone companies work because of the way it treats infrastructure. It found a new way of reaching ever more people by sharing mobile phone masks and outsourcing just about everything to suppliers in a way Western companies wouldn't dream of doing. I think the other area which is creeping around transport, I think, and an area where I would argue the Japanese never really touched back in the 1970s and 1980s, is the public sector. The Indian railways may not be very good, but just look, for instance, at their health care. In India, people are applying the sort of management techniques that we normally see to business to public sector, particularly to healthcare, even to odd things like heart surgery. India's best known heart surgeon is a man called Devi Shetty. He has set up a thousand bed heart 
specialist hospital. To give you an idea of way, the way it works in most places, in America, a typical heart hospital has 160 beds. This is almost industrial production of medicine. The result is he can do open heart surgery for $2,000. You go to America, it costs you $20,000 or $100,000. And the reason, despite that, is he still makes more money. His profit margins are greater. And he, too, is coming to the West. He's setting up in the Cayman Islands with a 2,000-bed hospital there. What's interesting to me about this is if you talk to somebody, I talked to one of the big, one of the big drugs companies came in the other day, they even jokingly put forward the idea that what is happening in India, in medicine, is perhaps the only hope America has of trying to deal with its, its huge healthcare costs going forward. It already consumes 17% of GDP. If they're going to bring that down at all, they're going to have to borrow the same sort of ideas that the Indians are coming on. Now, it strikes me from your point of view that every negotiation you have going forward with governments or consumers or voters is going to be about doing much, much more with much, much less, because that is going to be the context in which business generally is operating, and it's likely to be one in which transport and the public sector is going to have to push completely. We are all going to have to raise our game, I think, but I think it's particularly true this time of the public sector. Why? Well, I think that is because the second big argument that I was talking about, because this change in innovation is, I think, coinciding with an equally big argument about the role of the state. Once again, I think you've heard a lot, and just talking to people this morning, you've heard a lot about the idea of underinvestment, that you haven't received enough money, if you want to put it that way. And in a nutshell, my response will be, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, because you're going to get even less going forward. What do I mean by this debate about the state? I think if you try and look, and I apologise for the big pretentious nature of this, but if you look at the moment, I think there are two competing visions for the, the future of, of politics. One is, and this is the one that has hogged the headlines of the past three years, is essentially that capitalism is broken. And you look at most of the things said on the streets of Athens, if you look at a lot of the rumblings from the likes of um, uh, Sarkozy and Merkel, even from Barack Obama, the idea that laissez-faire is dead, as Nicholas Sarkozy said, you have to see the fury with Wall Street, you see the fury against bankers. Well, the underlying point of this is that globalization needs to be somehow restrained to be brought back. Facetiously, I'm tempted to argue that this is perhaps the only way that you could save problems like congestion, because if you manage miraculously to stop economic growth, which is what I suspect some of these people are very close to doing, then you actually manage to solve congestion. Um, Britain's congestion went down 3% thanks to the recession. But I think more generally, I think that there is a feeling, which I suspect many people in this room were quite sympathetic towards about a year ago, that actually things were sort of moving in the direction of more money for, for, for sectors like transport. After all, markets have been shown not to work that well. There was a renewed faith in governments. There was that huge big stimulus. There was the idea that suddenly holes would be filled and things would be pushed forward. There was $30 billion promised for new roads and bridges in America. $60 billion pledged for a national infrastructure bank. Well, it very patently has not happened. But very simply, the money wasn't there. And the money which was there wasn't spent well. The $60 billion for the National Infrastructure Bank has strangely now been reduced to $4 billion. Earlier this morning, I, we spoke to an American businessman who said that there was a $1 trillion hole to fill in terms of transport infrastructure. They spent $2 trillion and still missed it. I think more generally, the reason why this is happening is because I see a different second argument. If one argument is concentrating on the woes of capitalism, I think there's the beginning of another one which is beginning to look at re-examining the state. You saw it in America, I would argue, in the re revolution, I suppose, in Massachusetts, where people worried about Obama's health care plans, rightly or wrongly, voted for a man called Scott Brown, who was heavily against it. You saw in Britain an election which was focused almost entirely on electoral pain, on the idea that the state had to be cut in some way. Even in regions as historically status as Scandinavia and southern Europe, you're beginning to see debates about the size and effectiveness of government. Why? I think the obvious prompt is that governments need to cut. They need to 
pull back because of all the money they spent on the banks and the euro for that matter. But I think there's also something deeper. Go back to the 1990s and look at Britain and America. That was a time when people stepped forward and claimed that the era of big government was dead. Well, it wasn't really because under George Bush, American government grew to unbelievable heights. In Britain, government surged over the past 20 years. It went from about the last 10 years. It went from 48 percent in 2000, from 37 percent in 2000 to 52 percent of GDP at the moment. In swathes of northern Britain, the state now accounts for a bigger share of the economy than it did in the communist bits of the ex-Soviet bloc, as high as 70 percent. Now, this, by any measure, is unsustainable even more so because of the dem demographic problems that most of the OECD countries face. Aging populations will consume ever more public health care and ever bigger pensions. Unless someone takes an axe to them, entitlements will consume a fifth, a fifth of America's GDP in 15 years. Now, I think the stage is set for a huge rethink, at least potentially. I'm not sure exactly which direction that rethink will go because I think there is this contrasting argument. On the one hand, one group of people rushing to blame bankers, the other group rushing to blame bureaucrats. But I think I have three hunches about directions in which it will go. The first is somewhat ideological, and that is that on the whole, bigger, or sorry, better, will, to a large extent, mean smaller. What do I mean by that? I'm not ideologically wedded to that idea straightforwardly, but The Economist, we supported Obama's health care plans if only because we thought they were the decent thing to do. But in general, when you look at the public sector, you see a lot of waste that can be cut. Slimming a workforce by a tenth is something the private sector does on a fairly regular basis, but is deemed, for the most part, unacceptable in the public sector. Yet Sweden and Canada managed it and remained pleasant countries. Public sector pay can be cut, public sector pensions by most standards are far too generous, entitlements can be cut, and repeatedly you're going to have this drumbeat of cleverer ways to do it, maybe those examples from India which I talked about earlier. My second hunch is that if this debate begins to move forward, strangely the place where it might, the first place where it might become very visible is actually Britain. It's not just the budget deficit is a terrifying 11.6% of GDP, a figure that makes some kind of cuts inevitable. I think there's some element to do with the no, new coalition government in Britain which binds these people together is a distrust of central government. It's the one thing the Liberals and the Conservatives have in common. You'll see the reform of the NHS by bringing in more outside providers, giving parents and teachers the right to set up schools, devolving power to local mayors, and so on. There was this the odd idea which David Cameron spoke about called the big society, which was quite largely hot air, but it didn't have one gleam of a big idea behind it. And that was the idea that the, to reduce the state meant you had to reduce demand for the state as well as supply for it. Underneath it, and I apologize for mentioning Britain, I wouldn't have done for about 30 years, but I think there's a genuine point where Britain could become interesting for the first time since Margaret Thatcher if they push ahead of this. Because behind it, it will not just be about cutting, it will be about trying to rethink what the state does. What exactly should be the boundaries of the state? What should it do? If you want to redesign the tax system, why not switch from one based around income taxes to ones based around consumption or property tax? Or why not, for instance, introduce a carbon tax? And that leads to my third hunch. And that third hunch is that transport, transport will be a significant part of this debate for a variety of reasons, both good and bad. A bad one is that transport is, for better or worse, often an easy place to look for cuts. It's very easy to not start or to mothball projects that have been started. You saw that with Obama's infrastructure bank. I think you might well see it with these programs like Crossrail, Crossrail in London. It's also an easy way to raise money if you can get it right. It's fascinating to me the way when you look at toll roads or high, high occupancy toll roads. They began as a system to go and build new roads, then it went down to building new lanes. Now it's a way of just taxing parts of the existing roads to bring in more money for a government to go and spend elsewhere. That may be a good thing from the point of view of the environment. 
if you can find ways from the government's point of view to take money out of the economy through transport, then that is useful. And it's possible even, I think, the carbon tax would work within that. I think there's also more virtuous reasons, which you may not entirely agree with, why transport should be a big part of this rethink. Transport, I think, with the possible exception of agriculture, is one of the great centres of, of government confusion and waste, of boondoggles, of bridges to nowhere, of imperfections, of uncosted externalities, and so on. If you want to measure how well the state works, what its limits are, then it strikes me transport is one of the first areas you begin to look at very hard. Transport has always been in that murky area between the private and public sectors. If this debate starts, which as I expect, then I think it needs to be opened up. And I think there are rich areas to do so. Look at airlines, for instance. We have the most global air industry in the world, and to, to some extent, and yet at the same time, policed by national carriers, which find it very hard, strangely, to go bust, despite making no money, and outdated laws about who is allowed to take over who. And no, code sharing is not the same as owning things. There's also debates about who owns what. You have this fundamental problem at the moment where the public sector has no money, the private sector is awash with liquidity. How can you unite those two things? There's also the question of new infrastructure, more pricing and information. Does all this sound needlessly negative? I think it would be easy to conclude from your point of view that all I'm saying is that there are these two revolutions coming towards you and the net result for you is no more money that your paymasters are repeatedly going to say, look, they do that so much cheaper in China or India, why should you get money? Find new ways to tax or to toll or to bring get cash in. I think actually that fundamentally is the wrong way to approach this revolution. Most obviously, I think innovation is not a zero-sum game. The West will learn from the East just as we did with the Japanese. After all, the Japanese came here and gave us lean production now, Western, ever since then, Western car companies and other forms of Western factories have been fighting back. Secondly, I think within this world I'm depicting, transport has got a very strong case to make. It is an unbelievably big competitive advantage. If you want to keep knowledge workers, then you have to give them roads and trains that work, as well as universities that do. Finally, and this is rather close to what you're talking about this week, I think it spurs or may indeed bully the various governments around here into the sort of cooperation that perhaps has been long overdue. If you have to make do with less, which I think is the pretty much unanswerable conclusion of what's going to happen going forward, then it makes so much more sense to try and share things together. The environment is the ultimate collaborative problem. There is no way you're going to deal with a world with three billion cars, if that's what we're heading towards, without some degree of collaboration. Even look at me, I'm a mildly Eurosceptic Briton, but if I was made Transport Minister, sadly, not something particularly likely at the moment, one of the first things you would look for because of that shortage of money is partnership with the rest of Europe. There's not much point in doing a carbon tax or doing things like that if the rest of Europe is not somehow involved. If you are not much point in trying to open up your bit of the European air market if nobody else does. There are fundamental questions, I think, more generally, and I'm intrigued by the fact next year you're looking at the issue of transport and society. The relationship between governments and this very, very, at the moment, top-down industry and the consumers at the other end of it, I think all those things come up for question and a lot of the answers involve collaboration. Now, you might think that the world which I've depicted to you is maybe too dramatic a change. Uh, nothing tends to move that fast in a world where it takes a long, long time to build things. Well, you may be right, but I would finish on two points. The first is if you go to the emerging world, you see change on an unimaginable scale. To give you just one statistic, in one year, I'm pretty sure it was 1997, more Chinese people moved from the countryside to the cities than moved from across the Atlantic in the hundred years before 1920. You're seeing demographic change on a scale unknown before, and your industry will have to deal with it. And secondly, if you sit there thinking 
that actually all this stuff which is happening miles away doesn't really matter and all these theoretical debates about what exactly the state does or doesn't do, well, again, you could be right. You could survive. But you could just, just possibly be like those people in Detroit looking out across the water wondering how on earth those clever Japanese have managed to produce all those cheap cars. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much indeed. Um, John is going to join us, and I think chairs are going to arrive now, uh, and other bits of furniture. Um, so just relax for one moment, John, take your folder with you. And what I'll do um, as the, the furniture comes on um, is just reflect uh, on a couple of things which I think you need to think about um, uh, as uh, we move forward into uh, the kind of uh, uplift and harnessing that can go on. I've taken the trouble to go back to the questions for the first plenary. Um, how far have you really begun to answer how you can reconcile the disconnects between different elements of the transport system, put people first in our innovation, injecting creativity into our planning, correcting the role for the public sector, and you've just heard John saying it's going to be doing much, much um, uh, more for much, much less. Uh, you've heard him talking about the, where money is going to be. How much have you really begun to answer those questions? Um, there's going to be strong agreement on the what. I think that's what we've heard. But, uh, and that's where we need more innovation. But disparate aspirations still on the how. Let me invite uh, the, the first panelist to come up. John, would you like to sit on the, the far side? I th is that where your name has been put? Uh, there will do fine. I can't see over the... The tops. Um, one expert panel on Wednesday um, talked about the awareness of the urgency of the, the need to innovate, but it's sometimes lacking. The fiscal consolidation which will force transport providers to work um, smarter and cheaper. And this need to find new ways of doing things, as John has just underlined several times, in times of adversity. Often those are the best conditions uh, for innovation. And then the issue of the question of government getting out of the way, but a need to for innovation in public policy. Again, as John has just underlined. And the fragmentation of, of policy responsibilities hindering effective policy making. And the scale of transport problems often exceeding the national borders. Uh, so international coordination is indispensable. Um, these are the kind of things that have already come out in several uh, of the groups so far. And so what I'm trying to do is focus your minds on that um, before 12.15 particularly uh, what happened from what, what emerged from the global transport system of the future uh, session. Real innovation likely coming from small innovators, and yet it is precisely these actors that faced the greatest regulatory barriers. Well, uh, we've now been joined by the first uh, four of the nine panelists, uh, plus John, to push things forward um, on uh, working which way things are going to move in the future and what you have to do uh, in your business. Scott Belcher, uh, Jean-Pierre Lubineau, Jean Liris, and Hans Ratt, welcome to you all. And what I ask them to do is give us a summary in no more than three minutes of how they see things at the moment and what is left hanging after your discussions of the last two days where we need much more work um, in the next couple of hours to at least give you a sense of where things can move to or should be moving to. And I want you to be as radical as possible. I'd like this to be, as I said, for those of you uh, who weren't here maybe right at the beginning, give you a sense of brainstorming as much as anything else and I'd like you to be, feel you can contribute as well um, either by raising your hand or please sending me a bit of paper with just some scrawl of the kind of issue you'd like to raise and I'll make sure that that gets uh, injected into the discussion at the, the appropriate moment and I'll come to you uh, in person. Um, 
And also Tony May, who's Emeritus Professor of uh, Transport Engineering at Leeds University. I've asked Tony to um, act as a kind of reality checker as we go through this first session uh, before coffee. And at coffee, we'll, re we'll reflect on where we've got to and what more needs to be done to keep the, the, um, the, uh, the momentum going uh, as we address this, these critical issues of getting down to business, partnerships for a more innovative transport system. That's what we're looking at, certainly between now and coffee and after coffee as well. Well, we've heard from you, John. Let's uh, move to Scott Belcher, uh, first of all, um, President of the Intelligent Transportation Society of America, the ITS. Well, good morning. Um, the thing that I've, I've been interested in um, and, and I haven't heard addressed nearly as much as I'd like is, is, is how governments take advantage of viral in, for innovation, the innovation that takes place through crowdsourcing and over the website, because it's seen over the Internet, it seems that there's a, a great deal of innovation that's occurring uh, that we need to figure out how to capture. Let me give you three examples of how this has happened in the United States successfully. Um, the Massachusetts Department of, of Transportation placed all of its transit information, made it publicly available to um, applications developers, and then convened, um, convened a, a, a meeting of applications developers. As a result of, of that exercise in making um, what was previously pr uh, not publicly available, available data public, they now have a traveler information system that is being uh, provided uh, that is more robust than the traveler information system they had before and it's being provided to them for free. A second example is ITS America hosted a, a, what we called a congestion challenge. And we, it, it, the equivalent of an X challenge, we went out and over the internet and, and gave an award to the best solution for congestion. We had over 5,000 participants from over 40 countries with um, almost 200 solutions that were winnowed down by the participants to a final winner. Um, and that was a company that had taken ITS and utilized uh, technology um, to enhance ride sharing. But it was through the use of crowdsourcing, it was through the use of innovation that they were able to refine that product. Now the United States government is using that same platform uh, to, to try to generate innovation, um, again, through, uh, through the public. And then a final example is that the New York City Department of Transportation provided a very small amount of money for awards um, for what they've called a smart application uh, challenge. And as a result of that, uh, smart applications for, the, for, for smartphones. And as a result of that, they now have um, applications that are actively being used that can identify um, for, the, for the government where infrastructure air, um, problems are, potholes, cracks in the road, et cetera, when the next bus is going to arrive, where, the tax, where taxis are most likely going to be placed. And all of those things were done for hundreds or, or, or very small amounts of money, making huge changes in a way that's capturing innovation that's, that's different than most of the innovation that we've discussed and over the last couple of days. Quickly, Scott, do you see pickup on this at the moment? Do you see an awareness? Are the mindsets changing? I do, and, and I think, it, I think it, it goes back to some of the comments before. It's being driven by the financial limitations that, that um, governments are facing. That right. They're needing to be creative. Jean-Pierre Lebeneau, Director General of the International Railways Union, where do you see the potential now? Well... For sure, we are in a, in a world with uh, competing uh, actors and competing operators. And uh, we are also in a sector, I can certainly th talk for the rail sector, which I represent, but the whole transport sector is getting more and more fragmented. But let's, let's face it, there is not enough space, there is not enough time, there is not enough money to avoid looking for better synergies. And this, whether it be in developing countries or in developed countries, or as just the John mentioned, highlighted, uh, between developed or developing countries. And uh, through all the discussions and the ideas we have exchanged in this uh, forum, I can certainly see two needs that can be pushed uh, better forward. One is uh, that more complementarity between modes is becoming uh, a necessity. Uh, in terms of more fluidity, 
in terms of more interoperability, whether this be technical, whether this be uh, administrative interoperability for better communicating uh, systems. And we can certainly talk about that with, uh, with, with, with my neighbor. Another, another need I can certainly uh, identify is uh, partnerships. We need more partnerships to bring these innovative ideas forward to bring them come true. You mentioned, Nick, uh, that uh, what to do is good, how to do it, or knowing how to do it is better, doing it is even better again. And uh, I am not thinking in partnerships only in the terms of the uh, evident PPP, as we mentioned, but also in terms of new forms of partnerships uh, to work uh, on uh, elaborated cooperation in this fragmented sector. It can be financial, new ideas, or partnership with institutions, or partnerships uh, within the industry. And this, I think, are the two points I would like to, 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 to see further pushed. Right. John Laris, um, Chairman of the Shipping Policy Committee of the International Chamber of Shipping. Yes, thank you, Nick. <clears throat> well, I have to blow my horn here because shipping is the almost invisible industry. But I think there are things in our industry which are um, useful as a model for other debates and other sectors, and that is that Firstly, that we are the first uh, global industry before globalization became a catchword or the global economy became the dominant model. So um, we've had uh, international regulation through the International Maritime Organization, which is a UN agency <clears throat> set up after the Second World War, and the ILO um, right from the um, 50s and 60s. So we have international conventions and regulation um, which um, apply to safety, envi environmental protection, compensation and operation of ships uh, for a very long time. Uh, also, we're a global industry, so we find that uh, whereas Europeans still control, for instance, 40% of the fleet, 90% uh, of the ships are built in the Far East. 60% um, of our crews come from the Far East. So there's an internationalization and outsourcing, if you like, that happened long before this also became a catchword uh, in our industry. And one thing which I think is pertinent and, um, and perhaps um, very uh, much in line with what John was saying before, uh, we're an industry that's not really corporate. We're a kind of proprietary entrepreneurial industry, and I think this is a very good thing. I mean, it's... Uh, I think it accounts for the dynamism of the industry and for its ability to um, adapt. Um, and where it ha it's not like that, like in the liner sector where you have sort of uh, very big players, uh, they have a lot more problems, as we know, than, than we do in the bulk sector. So here's a model that's uh, considered old-fashioned, but we may need to kind of uh, look at it again, because I think that it's um, all, 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 all round, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good model, and it has proved its dynamism. Uh, lastly, with regard to innovation per se, um, the major innovation in shipping came in the last century. It was uh, in terms of propulsion in the first half of the last century, and in terms of logistics, economies of scale, um, and um, energy efficiency um, in the second half of the last century, specialization as well. Um, so uh, that has happened in shipping, and um, we are fossil fuel dependent, and this is something that policymakers and the media and the public have to realize. So in terms of climate change and other debates and other worries that are very kind of legitimate right now, I think that uh, we can't treat all transport modes in the same way. Um, so, in effect, uh, there, there could be incremental innovation in our industry as far as shipbuilding is concerned and ship operating, but not a lot. Uh, whereas, for instance, and I'll end there, uh, there are a lot of ports around the world that have been the same since antiquity, you know. So, I mean, we have a problem with interface. Where can you take a sort of 250,000 ton tanker in the States into which port? We can't. We take it to the Louisiana offshore pipeline. And so that's just an example. I don't mean to blame the U.S. <laughs> but I'm saying that uh, there is a sort of very big problem in terms of the interface in, in a lot of ports around the world, not all of them. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Hans Rat, Secretary General of the International Association of Public Transport, your two-minute reflection on what is still left hanging 
unresolved, um, without enough attention, given the enormity of the challenge now facing the business? I think that, uh, challenge the bigger, that the challenge is bigger, as has been uh, told. Uh, I think that you have less time. Uh, the city of Houston spends 15% of its GDP to mobility. Cities like Tokyo, cities like Singapore, cities like, uh, 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 cities like uh, 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 let's say, uh, Hong Kong, spend 5%. There's a difference of 10%, which we are, is coming ahead, means that the, uh, let's say, the developed world can no longer ignore this spill. This it's impossible. So I think we have come to the end of the era where we can have a mobility system based on private cars and a mobility system of public transport. That's, that's uh, a matter of 10 years we are able to change. As an association, we are planning uh, increase of modal share of uh, doubling market share of public transport in the next 15 years. What's helping us is that young people are doing what governments fail to do, and at least they change their mind. Here in Germany, a uh, population until 26 years old have less than 50%, has 50% less driver licenses than uh, before the year 2000. Youngsters are no longer focused as strong as private cars, as baby boomers, as our generations did. They don't uh, get away from, they still like cars, but there are other gadgets they like more. What's helping us in this shift is uh, information technology. Uh, GPS might be considered to be the main innovation in uh, private cars. When you listen to manufacturers of GPS systems, they say that their bigger market is the market of pedestrians. And they will help people navigating in an urban environment which is more friendly than the urban environment based on the use of the private car. That's what's happening. Thank you. Um, John, I'm going to come to you in a moment, but I want to ask each of the four on the panel, and also uh, Tony May, do you think you are thinking radically enough for the kind of enormity of the kind of challenges that John has laid out? Scott, is there the radical sort of shift of the mindset and awareness that it can't be a comfortable option a few years down the road, that there are really very serious challenges now which have got to be addressed much quicker than perhaps the industry is, is used to addressing them in? Well, I think the, the, the challenge we face in the United States is, um, on, on, in that respect is, is um, a disconnect between the way that we've developed our infrastructure and the way that we have to move forward. We've been, we've, we have a very dispersed, uh, con a very dispersed co country um, with some very dense cities, but mass, mass areas um, that are not uh, conducive to um, public transit or to dense populations. And we're in a movement right now where we're trying to, to, to emulate um, European cities with dense population and large, large public transit. And we're going to have to realize, I think, as we move forward that it's, um, uh, that it's complicated and that um, different parts of the country are going to be, de are going to develop in different ways. And then that's going to make it even more challenging. And so innovation is going to be even more critical. Jean-Pierre, do you think your business, your industry, your part of your sector of the industry is embracing the kind of things that John has been talking about, having to do much, much more with much, much less? Transport in government, it's a great node of confusion and waste, but also the public sector, quote, will have almost no money, but the private sector is awash with liquidity. It's about adaptability in this new environment. Is your part of the business up to it? Well, yes. When you say, are we radical enough, to be totally radical is to change everything. And I don't think we have precisely the time or the money to do so. At the same time, we must recognize the immense heritage that we have with the rail infrastructure all over the world. Uh, what we need to do is push its limits 
further and further uh, to answer the growing needs of mobility for the society and to answer them, as we just mentioned, in complementarity with other modes. And to do this, I think the innovative ideas already on the table are quite expensive, quite lengthy to put in place in terms of better communication, longer trains, heavier trains, better logistics, better services on, uh, uh, in the stations and on the trains. And if I had the time, I would really further develop the station hub as really the platform of uh, complementarity innovation ideas between modes. So yes, there is plenty of uh, not radical, but very new ideas, not mentioning sustainability, traction energy, hybrid engines, and, and so forth. So there is plenty of new ideas maybe if 20% of them come true in the 20 years to come uh, we certainly bring a progress to society at large you use the word expensive there um, suggesting that that was the only way things would be would evolve when it comes to new and radical innovative ideas does it all have to be expensive what about smart cheaper ideas I mean as I mentioned at the beginning there were parts of sessions saying quite often innovation comes in times of difficulty financially simply because you find new cheaper ways of doing it True, but we are in a very industrialized sector uh, where innovation is sometimes very, very technological and needs a lot of time, a lot of testing. Uh, we have also to be so caring about the need for safety that we need to test, test, and test again. So this is, in the end, expensive. But you are right to say that it should not be an obstacle because an expense today can be a return tomorrow. And there is there something which has been tackled in this forum, which I would like to insist very much upon, is that uh, the only uh, return on investment or financial return on investment for the transport sector and certainly for the rail sector should not be the only concern uh, and the uh, better integration of external cost, the uh, benefits for society at large can certainly be being, being, uh, thought in advance to up, uh, offset all these expenses uh, to bring innovation forward, definitely. This is what we are trying to do in UIC. John, in the end, okay, massive um, uh, investment, massive costs um, in your business, but do you think your business is thinking radically enough, again, given what John has laid out as the major challenges at the moment? Well, we, we are in, uh, especially in bulk shipping, as I mentioned before, we're an almost perfectly competitive market. I mean, it's quoted in textbooks, in economic textbooks that people uh, are taught at university. So we have to be lean. We, we've, we've always had to be lean. So uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, there's already a huge amount of international cooperation, which is not partnership, but which is uh, just synergies. As I mentioned, ships are built in the Far East. They're manned mainly in the Far East. They're owned by um, uh, Europeans. Uh, they may have their sort of uh, management headquarters in Singapore or somewhere else. So there's a lot of adaptability already, and especially in the bulk sector, as I mentioned before. Uh, I think that uh, what can be improved in the future is basically uh, not very much. It's incremental, and uh, it will be driven by regulation, uh, in, in effect by the regulations that are going to come out about air emissions and about the amount of uh, pollution that um, uh, sh shipping produces operationally. So change will only come from regulation, not, not self-generated? Well, uh, it, it will come from regulation. I hope it's going to be a sort of realistic regulation. It's going to come from the industry. It comes from the industry anyway because, you know, energy efficiency, which produces the uh, emissions, is something that's a standard um, uh, requirement or, or, or um, let's say, uh, um, objective, reducing, in other words, uh, the, uh, the um, consumption of energy on board ships. So that's, that's, that's going on anyway. Uh, but what can be feasibly achieved, given that a ship is a big barge, effectively, that is pushed through the water, unless there's some very big breakthrough, which we don't see in the future, for instance, if all ships become nuclear-powered, which is politically perhaps uh, totally sort of um, unacceptable right now, then, uh, as I said, it's going to be incremental, and I think it's going to be um, regulation-driven because of the impatience of the public with what they perceive erroneously as being a polluting industry, whereas, as I said before, we're a, we're a fossil fuel captive industry. Uh, I'm, is Ron Widow still here? 
Yeah, Ron, I'm going to put the point you were making to me yesterday about the fact that no one's actually buying new ships at the moment. Um, uh, you can't get any bank loans, the, you can't get any finance, but the, as John has said, there's a lot of cash out there, private cash. How do you resolve this in, in an industry which will have to modernize, which has got to modernize? You say it's got to be, um, it's got to be a, a regulation which is kind of acceptable as opposed to regulation which might be imposed upon you. How do you see this developing? Well, the, the reason why no ships are being built today is, uh, is that too many have, <laughs> were ordered in the last five years. And uh, this is something that's, again, endemic to our industry, and we've been uh, living with it for a long time, which is the cyclicality and the sort of uh, often oversupply of tonnage in, in many areas. So um, we, have, um, we have experience in dealing with that. When I say we, I mean most of these sort of long-term uh, shipping businesses and not people who kind of invest in it um, temporarily. Uh, so um, the ships that are being built now are more efficient uh, in terms of energy, as uh, new ships will be in the future. Uh, but as I mentioned before, uh, most of the ships are built in the Far East, so the, the hull, for instance, and anything that can be done to the hull which will make it more efficient is up to the shipbuilders in the Far East to, um, uh, to come up with, uh, with pressure from ship owners who order the ships. And as far as the propulsion is concerned, the ship, the, the machines, the, the uh, fourth shipping, the uh, main engine and so on, are also built in the Far East, but the patents and the designs are European. So there, the research has to be in Europe. And it's not, uh, maybe I should point this out, because we are sort of entrepreneurial and proprietary companies, there are about 6,000 shipping companies around the world. So the average size of a shipping company is small, and it's not... Uh, possible for each company to do its own research. So we rely on institutions like the Ship Classification Society to do that for us, which again is a model, if you like, because this is an international institution with many members from the, around the world, class societies, I mean, and they're the people who pool, if you like, the um, uh, research and do the research for shipping. Hans, the same question to you. Do you think your business is really thinking likely enough at the moment? Uh, not enough. Uh, it's happening. I think there has far too long been a focus on vehicle and track technology uh, and operations technology in public transport. Uh, there is a change to lifestyle business. Uh, uh, operators understand more and more that they have to change from a network operator to a mobility service provider. Uh, you see uh, all over the world at the moment that uh, uh, public transport systems are linking up with car sharing, with bike sharing. Uh, they are changing into lifestyle business. Uh, it was in, in somewhere in the Far East that I uh, found out that Yves Saint Laurent has a children's clothes line in a metro station. And, and uh, all of a sudden, you perceive that, that uh, a mobility service starts at a certain point where people like to go. A nice uh, fancy shopping mall uh, at the basement of, of, of uh, uh, apartment blocks or things like that. And, and uh, the, the, the train connecting stations is just a piece of technology. And whether it's a train or a bus, doesn't matter. You see that when you go to the famous bus systems in Latin America, which are reproduced in other parts of the world, where you see station-like uh, uh, situations where people like to go, they feel safe, they get into the piece of technology, can be a bus or a train, it brings them to another place. Uh, urban navigators guide them to the place where they need to be. So that's, that's, it's, it's more a focus on... on, on customer services and, and uh, on people services and, and that's what's happening and it's happening dramatically and that's why uh, we attract a lot of clients and if you look to the nice booklet you got in your delegates back and you see the data which has been uh, given by the uh, International Transport Forum you see that public transport in general uh, has not been suffering from the economic crisis and you see lots of countries where growth is still going on. So the shift is happening already. Right. Professor Tony May. And let me encourage others of you to engage in this at this stage. We've got an hour and a half still to go with the two sections, so I've got no questions up here. So please uh, come in as early as you can before I go to John. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Um, 
three suggestions, if I could. First of all, we've heard a lot about uh, innovations in technology and in policy, and, and those are obviously making major contributions. But it's clear, it's clear from what John was saying this morning that we need innovation in governance as well. And we need that at an international level, we need it at a national level, we need it at a local level. All governments and their interactions with industry and uh, the public need, as John said, to do more for less. So how is that innovation in governance going to be generated and how is it going to be disseminated? Second point, uh, I think it's very clear from experience throughout the industry that there is a minority of innovators and a majority who are blissfully unaware that innovation is taking place. So there's a key role for innovation in a fourth area, which is knowledge deployment or policy transfer. And that, it seems to me, is a very important role for the forum. If the forum can help in one area, it will be encouraging cities and governments that are less innovative, and indeed industry that's less innovative, to become more so and to learn from others. The third point I wanted to raise was the question of diversity. John set up this morning a, a vision in which the emerging economies are lead innovation and the developed economies are learning quickly and incorporating that. But of course there's a third and very disparate group of countries around the world who are less developed who probably need innovation even more urgently than the rest of us do. How do we make sure that innovation is focused on their needs and that they too are encouraged to innovate themselves and to learn from the innovations of others? Tony, thank you. John, your reflection, you've parachuted into this uh, on the third day of, of discussion, but do you, do you sense an industry which is getting what you've been talking about? Actually, I think it's very interesting. I, I sense a top-down industry struggling with a, a huge change in front of it, with a new world. And actually, what really intrigues me is shipping. Is that, uh, from the little I did know about the transport industry, shipping was always seen as the one which was different, um, because I don't think it's quite the free market paradise that John um, pa painted. I think there, there, there are some slightly odd habits inside it, like cabotage, and, the, and it's not that clean and... and, and the full costs of some things it does, particularly environmentally, aren't always affected. But by most people's standards, it's a hell of a lot closer to a, to a sort of normal business where there's supply and demand and things going backwards and forwards. And what intrigues me about transport, and again, in a big, tentious, conceptual way, is I think through some of the stuff which Scott's saying, you're beginning to see people beginning to think that there are other bits of the transport industry where you could begin to apply those same rules of supply and demand. And what again interests me is the idea that in general so far I think the main answer of uh, the transport industry to pretty much any problem, obviously congestion, but other things has been infrastructure, has been let's build some more stuff. Uh, I wonder to what extent the mixture out of technology, pricing and other things like that begin to solve at least some of those problems or redirect things in new ways. And I'm not quite sure exactly which way those things go. It's, it's not going to go, we're not all going to move to a crowdsourcing model. And it's, it, I don't know how on earth you do crowdsourcing on railways um, in terms of um, building railway lines suddenly across people's gardens because everyone's voted for it on YouTube. But, but it's, it, it's, it's not going to move that far, but there must be more room towards it. And I think that is where it's the relationship between that and the governments. But it's the idea that the sort of shipping model is no longer quite so weird, quite so strange compared with everyone else that I think is intriguing to me. But again, with your work on, on globalization and, and with the speeding up of information uh, and the speeding up of public expectations and the need to be nimble, it's being shown in every single industry, mm. is there a clear message to build on what you've said this morning about the fact that you can't wait five to ten years? The pressures are much more acute, particularly when there are the uncertainties at the moment of the, the financial framework in which we're now all, all, all operating. I think that one odd thing is I think in some ways um, consumers in the Western world are less, um, some, some cases are less um, impatient than ones in the emerging world. You see, a, you, you go to Shanghai 
and admittedly, you, you see a lot of people who've been unused to anything before, but they, they are, the, the, the traffic is so crippling there, the, the problems are so dramatic that transport is right at the very front of what they do. And this may be um, a, a particularly um, a British thing, which, which some of us undergo. That, you know, the British just every day climb onto the tube, sit there, and probably all of us, uh, we sit there, we, we endure unending pain and suffering, and then we arrive somewhere close to our destination, usually somewhere later than we were meant to do. I, I think people who are coming new to this transport problem may be able to change it. There, there is a certain advantage in industries in having a tabula rasa. We, 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 there's a very good point about um, Africa and Tony made, that, 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 but all the same, it's interesting in a lot of the fields I talked about, if you look at money transfer by mobile phones, the leader there is not any of the countries we've talked about, it's Kenya. So it is possible sometimes to jump a long way ahead in these emerging markets. So I've slightly gone off the, the, the core source of what you said, but I, 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 don't, I see sort of anger, general frustration and annoyance amongst Western consumers. I don't quite see how that, and I see some elements of the crowdsourcing that Scott talked about, but I don't, I don't quite see that immediately militating into something which is going to bully ministers of transport in, in Canada to do things. Do you get bullied, Minister? Every day. Every day. If you didn't hear him, every day, he says. <laughs> um, several people want... Rob, I, I'm sorry, um, Ron, I didn't see your hand go up, but I've moved the microphone on. I will come to as many people as possible. Keep your remarks as brief as possible, please. How many people do, do want to speak? I can see about ten. Who's got the microphone at the moment? There are several microphones. Could you move the microphone at least to someone who would like to speak? Who's got it at the moment? Please. No, you've got it. You've got it. Keep, speak. I can. Okay. Possession is power. <laughs> oh, hi. Marc Ajuel from the World Bank. Actually, I, um, I like the point just made about uh, how to actually keep low-developed countries uh, within this uh, innovation exchange. That's the point we touched upon yesterday during the panel discussion we had. And clearly from uh, in the World Bank perspective, there is a concern that to make sure that while indeed this all circulation of innovation works rather well uh, among developed countries and from uh, transition and let's developing countries which have already reached a point where they can actually uh, bring to the market new thinking and new way of doing things. And we have seen many examples of that in the past. The concern is that the lowest tier of, develop, of developing countries risk being shut out uh, of this and risk lose in, in the process if we don't pay attention uh, on how to make sure that they can be part of the game. And actually, we, we have seen a few things happening which seem to suggest that South-South cooperation in this matter uh, could actually provide some very interesting benefits. We have seen uh, innovation being picked up by, I would say, middle tier develop, developing countries and brought to uh, their neighboring ones. I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, port community systems which have been developed first by Singapore, then sold, so sold and implemented in Tunisia, and then Tunisia bringing those developments to Mauritania and other countries. Those countries accepting it more, much more easily from uh, uh, basically a neighboring country which has managed to get it and adapt it to its own needs. And this kind of exchange is certainly one way to keep the lowest tier of developing country uh, basically tied up to this innovation train. And that's something, of course, the bank is trying to facilitate by making sure we provide the means necessary uh, to bring uh, those trends of innovation down to the, the countries where markets are so thin and purchasing power so weak that it might be difficult, so just market forces uh, will, will make that happen. So that's something we'll certainly keep working on. Let me hear as many ideas as possible on uh, partnerships for a more innovative transport system, and then you can pick up the things which which attract you or you'd like to dispute or, or take on. Who's got the microphone there? Pass the microphone back, please, a little further back. Uh, thank you. Angela Paricio, University of Madrid, Spain. Well, uh, as I have been going through, through all these three day sessions, I was wondering whether there is also a problem in, in governance in the industry, in the sector in general. And I will try to, to explain myself a little better. Uh, for three days we have been having sessions mainly dominated by middle-aged male persons. Uh, I don't know to what extent this reflects reality in society. It's, it's not uh, the, 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 tramp, the transport industry getting a little bit isolated from the general trends in society. Aren't we people that are not seen to each other? 
for too many years. Basically, when we visit each other, we have those little, those small locomotives, those small cars on our desk. We, we, we really like the product. We, like, we really like the, 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 the uh, how to say, the, the tradition of, of what we are producing. And I, I am not sure whether we are open enough to all the general trends in society, if we are open enough to get the new feelings, new needs from, 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 from the very diverse uh, society we are, we, are, we are having in a globalized world. Thank you. Thank you. Pass the microphone back to the lady behind you. Um, uh, and then we'll go here. And further back, it's difficult to see you because it's quite dark. So put up a bit of paper or something as well. Thank you. Let me to go. Uh, Dennis Bevington, Member of Parliament, Canada. And I, I must admit that the, the, uh, the person uh, from Spain speaking about, about the nature of the discussion here, uh, I, I agree with as well. And I want to thank uh, some of the presenters here for speaking towards what I see as the, the new consumer, uh, the intelligent consumer, the one that wants to create its own uh, uh, transportation system through through the interconnection, and that's, that's really where we move from infrastructure to an organic development of the transportation system. You're paying compliment to that, but do you think there's enough recognition of that critical shift? No, because uh, quite, quite clearly, most transportation systems are dominated by large, large uh, concerns that want to control the consumer, rather than the consumer having the opportunity to make the choice about how he is going to interact with the transportation system. And, and I think that is where some of this dialogue here breaks down. And that's where I agree with the man from Spain. We should have some young people here telling us how they want to travel for the future. Yeah. Jack, should I put that to you? Younger people telling you how they want to respond uh, and travel in the future. Can, can I, could you just bring the microphone forward? Bitter, here, bitter. I have to say that's a, that's a comment I hear quite frequently at many conferences in many disciplines about the new next generation. Is that a fair comment, do you think? I, I'd say so, yeah, and I think it's one of the things we'll try and fix for next year. I mean, we had a small discussion on it this morning already, and the theme next year is transport and society, and we hope to have all the streams of uh, different users in there and take a more bottom-up approach to the thing next year. But it wasn't really the end this year to do it in such a way. But we have, changed. we have a lot of different people here than we had in the past, so we are changing it. And as an interim, is social media providing you now with new, new pressures on absolutely. the way you're thinking? It doesn't absolutely. have to be physically here in this hall in no, Leipzig. No, absolutely. The internet has changed already. The, the kind of people who are interacting and reacting to us, we're getting a lot of uh, people in getting involved in various things we do from India, for example, through the internet, which you know, has changed so quickly now. So you've made a point, you've made innovation in two minutes, so that's progress. Please. Yes, uh, Marie-Vonne Plessis-Fressard, uh, ex-World Bank. Uh, I'm really struck that in such very contrasted way, uh, all Bertrand Picard of Solar Impulse, Amar Bidet of Harvard, and this morning John from The Economist have given us very similar co coherent and, and reinforcing messages about the fact that change is upon us, rapid and, and radical, and innovation in not just about technology, and we have been so careful to look at technological changes, but also in management, in the relationship with the client, and uh, at all level, high technology, middle um, technical matters, and, and simple uh, um, implementation and detail of the implementation and interface with the client. So in fact, I, I come back to, uh, I follow up on what Marc Juel have said and the predecessor, that it really challenges the forum to find a way to efficiently bring in uh, these new forces because we are uh, calling on those who are responsible for managing very rigid structures when the changes come from other forces and we want to have an effective way to bring them together. Now bringing youth in a, in a seminar or, or in a forum is interesting but you, you don't want to have a chaos so the formatting of, um, of uh, 
um, this uh, um, bringing together this energy and this new idea is, uh, is the difficult thing to do. Let me, let me put it to you that the phrase should be something like the next generation, not youth necessarily. It, it's um, those who are still consumers and who would be encouraged to be consumers by transport systems which better serve the way they would like to live their and, lives. And the non-OECD country, because we are calling, from OECD we are thinking of how we react to the change, but this change is coming from non-OECD forces, and therefore it would be good to have those uh, uh, directly uh, with us in, in this um, discussion. Indeed, here there's one question I've had, uh, there's no name, about the, the way... Um, new entrepreneurship uh, in passenger transport is being incubated uh, in the underdeveloped countries and how that could be embraced by the developed world. Let me take one more comment before I go back to the panel, please. Um, I'm Yoshi Hayashi from Nagoya University, Japan. Uh, I'd like to describe this current situation of uh, developing megacities uh, because I have been working for uh, that uh, for many years. Um, that is, um, private cars are occupying road networks because of lack of public transport. That makes uh, the country not possible to compete with the developed countries, taking the advantage of low labor costs. That means uh, manufacturing industries. Uh, there are no rooms in the road network for the uh, freight transport, for, for uh, uh, the manufacturing industries uh, transport from uh, uh, factories to, to the port, uh, factories to the uh, market. That is the, one of the biggest problems. So how we can make the developing countries uh, powerful to become as early as possible to self-sustaining uh, in funding the uh, new infrastructures. So to do so, uh, we, do, we, are, we, agree, I, we agree with the panelists to uh, enhance more uh, funding for public transport. One is uh, to, just two, uh, uh, ODA, uh, greening of ODA, and make it uh, credited the, if the project is, will uh, reduce the CO2. Uh, that is a uh, UNFCC framework. Uh, ATA. The other is uh, to uh, reform the uh, approvement uh, uh, system of CDM. That will drastically uh, introduce uh, private fund that that are going to the other sectors of uh, transport now. Thank okay, you. thank you. There's another question here about how to include the next generation more rapidly, um, particularly with public government. Ron, can I just come to you? Because you, I think, wanted to just make a comment uh, about the shipping business. So let me just go to you immediately before I go back to the panel. Um, yes, uh, not, not narrowly on the shipping okay. business, but uh, to the points were made uh, earlier and, and to, the, uh, to the younger generation in particular. Uh, and this has to do with uh, you know, transport role in, in competitiveness broadly, which has implications to the Western or the developed world uh, more considerably than, uh, than, than many people realize. Uh, imagine the graphic, a 30-year-old worker picture. He wants your job people in the Western and or developed world. A picture of a five-year-old child. He wants your children's job. The drive to improve quality of life. I can tell you that uh, in, in the Western or developed world, the, the shift in attitudes relative to things as simple as car ownership. The billion and a half people in China, the billion people in India, the hundred million in Mexico where the average age is below 30, they want a car. <laughs> They want a car, they want a flat screen TV, they want everything you have. The drive and the intensity to improve that, the education system in China in particular, the things that are going on that are driving that part of the world into a much more competitive place has implications to the developed world, has implications to the transport sector that will continue to drive sourcing, manufacturing, jobs to those places put even more pressure on the Western or the developed world 
to be much more competitive than they are today or see even a more considerable shift uh, over time uh, in what we've seen in globalization today. And transport has a role there. Innovation has a role there where the developed world has some needs to a cause for action to improve its competitiveness or it's even a more dramatic shift which will make a lot of opportunity for companies like mine because more things will come from other places in the world. So a cause for action for the implementation of more efficient, more effective, more competitive things which drive uh, I think the issues that you're talking about this morning relative to partnerships are required not just the insular focus on each country's particular issues that they have. Remember, this discussion is going to go on until 12.15. Uh, we're going to switch panels during coffee, but we've got to keep the dynamic going and building on these issues over the next uh, uh, hour and a half still. Pick up, can you, uh, what you think has been uh, the most striking elements of the, the interventions we've had so far. John, as you won't be here probably uh, later on, uh, anything particular from what you've just heard? Um, I'm going to, in the, in the tradition of most provocateurs, I'm going to turn hypocritical and jump to the other end of the extreme um, and, and speak about two things. One is um, in defense of middle-aged white men with cars on their desks, and then secondly, in, in, to attack the consumer. Um, in terms of the first, what's, what's remarkable about to my team, and actually I think Ron just picked on it a bit, is that... If you wander around the emerging world, the, the, the big thing there is that they are, they are embracing the same dream of the middle-aged man with the car on his desk. If, if you give anybody, there's some golden rule of emerging market economics. If you give a family, once a family reaches around $5,000 of income, they, they try to get a pair of wheels. And it does seem to be, I'm afraid, as the lady pointed, somewhat driven by men, but it is a, it, it's sadly a factor of life. The, the second thing is, again, looking at the emerging world, there are some areas you can wander around bits of the um, bits of Africa in particular where you, in some ways you have a perfect free market in transport you have people taxis of all different sort of sorts trying to take people around and the result is chaos or particularly once you reach these huge cities you get incredible gridlock and so there is a need for government and, and again it's a, not a very popular thing to say but one reason why the Chinese have had such a huge effect in that continent is because they've turned up and they've started to do things which colonial powers used to do. They, they built roads, railways, and they've arguably done quite a lot of good by doing that. Um, and, 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 and so there, there is an element whereby government can make a difference there. And, and my, my second point was to attack consumers. It strikes me that consumers are deeply dysfunctional. If you, if you look at our infrastructure in the West, and most of the OECD part, countries, most of our transport infrastructure was built in the times when governments really could boss people about, when the Victorians could build sort of sewers without the slightest difficulty from people complaining about which direction they went, or railways. France, I think, still retains that unique ability, but other, other places yearn for it. Um, and it's, go to California. California's infrastructure is a complete mess, and the people to blame for it, 150% are Californians because they will not vote for anything. Um, they will only vote for tax cuts when they can get it. But any attempts to solve any of their infrastructural problems go into complete spirals. So that, that, that's one of my worries about the crowdsourcing, is if you hand over power to these maniacs, maybe these, these, these next generation... Careful, you're on, you're on the record here, John. <laughs> then, then, then it could be... I mean, there is, that's the other side of what we're doing. We, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, we're correct repeatedly to attack this top-down industry, but to the extent that consumers, I don't think, really know exactly what they want, it may reflect something else. Anyway. Danger, consumers may run transport system, seems to be your headline. But, Scott, pick up on that. Well, I, I actually agree with John. I mean, I think um, I, I brought up the crowdsourcing just because it hadn't been discussed nearly as much. I think one of the great, um, the great innovations that you're going to see that's going to help us leapfrog um, a lot of the infrastructure needs is going to be greater systems integration. When you're starting to link various transportation databases and transportation systems, it's going to enable governments to better manage the transportation infrastructure. And it's going to, I think, reduce or dampen some of the, the need for additional infrastructure. 
So I can be hypocritical and go back and forth too. What about um, also, remember what Tony said, uh, particularly about the role of government, and I'm conscious that uh, John made some very important remarks about that, particularly based on the extraordinary changes that there have been happened to have happened in Britain in the last three weeks. But just pick up, uh, can you, um, each of you, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, what is your view of some of the uh, areas we've heard raised about innovation? Well... Maybe in a nutshell, from picking up from a couple of reactions, uh, I would say that, uh, especially in, in the relation with the developing and developed countries, what I heard is, I want to insist on the fact that transport grows business, and business can grow transport. And therefore, I think a focus, or a bigger focus, on the development of business flows can also help the right ideas for the appropriate mobility system to be developed. Uh, and this goes into the, all the governmental efforts, actually, to grow the north and south or the east and west uh, business flows. Uh, I could give you the example uh, of the uh, uh, upbringing of the new Silk Road by rail. Just because there is a flow of business, a growing flow of business in that area or in these regions, linking these regions. So that's one uh, first reaction. The other reaction is uh, the word consumer. So it's business and consumer. I think it's very important to remember that the mobility uh, systems that we develop and how innovative they can be uh, are really uh, meant to serve the end consumer door to door, whether it's for freight or whether it's passenger. And uh, this, I think, is something which is in the thinking already a very radical innovation posture. Uh, the transport system, again, whether it's in freight or whether it's in uh, uh, passenger, should be, as you just mentioned, be considered as a system as a sort of a chain which is at the moment probably too loose and should be much more united. John. Well, I, I would. Um, I just thought of this. I think that uh, there's a lack of information uh, and awareness of the average citizen about transportation and, and what it does and how it does it. And maybe this should be something that should be put into the school curriculums because I think that mobility is uh, is uh, can be useful, but it can also be um, um, uh, wasteful. And uh, we all know that with population growing, I'm not talking about shipping now, that a lot of transport systems are getting into uh, congestion and, and dead dens because of the um, uh, physical um, inability to provide uh, space and so on. And what John mentioned before about people not uh, cooperating and therefore, you know, um, governments or local authorities having to spend years uh, trying to get the space where they need to put the infrastructure in. So, um, uh, starting from my industry, which is, uh, as I said before, the almost invisible industry, and people don't realize how much they rely on shipping uh, every day, you know, for, for what they have or what they aspire to. Uh, I believe there is a need for more information because as uh, we live in a, in a global village, and we all are all concerned about its survival and about pollution and so on, then each one of us has to know uh, how much energy we're consuming per head, um, what we can do to um, uh, reduce uh, unnecessary um, travel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think this, is, this, is, this I think comes in and connects with your mindset um, um, point and mindset point that John made before about thinking differently about the whole issue of transportation. Okay, can I just end by saying that for me it's rather sad that in China, which is a notocracy and so they can do a lot of things that we can't do in Western democracies much faster uh, than, than uh, we can, uh, it's sad for me that they're going for the urbanization mo model and that they're not being able or they can't seem to be able to keep people in the countryside and not have millions of people come into the cities. Uh, it's going to, it's, for me, they're going to have the same problems that we have in Europe sort of like in 20 years or 30 years' time again. Why? Hans. Uh, well, I'm traveling a lot uh, about public administration. Uh, 
I have seen decision making on public transport in China. I've seen it in the Middle East. I've seen it in, in Latin America. And the kind of discussions uh, we have in our Western uh, democracies are uh, similar to a certain extent in other systems of public administration, but they are stronger in taking decisions. I think that's, that's, that's a huge point. Second thing is that uh, uh, we are talking a lot of things which exist in OECD countries and which we have to resolve. I think they will be able to resolve uh, their own problems. Uh, 14 days ago we had a board meeting in Shanghai. We have a stand on the World Exhibition and all these things. And the interesting thing was that uh, Shanghai has a very strong car manufacturing industry and they are proud that they export a lot of them to Beijing and that it's a transport mass in Beijing, which is much tougher than in Shanghai. They are aware of these kinds of things. Uh, Middle East is uh, part of the world where public transport is booming, actually, because in their city benchmarking, they learned from the mistakes which has been made by us. Uh, Dubai, uh, it's not everywhere appreciated, but at least they found out that they need a strong public transport system. And they are, uh, they are developing it. It's quite successful. It will be more and more successful. It will has its domino effect over the whole Middle East. I think a lot, uh, two last remarks. Uh, young people, I think it's ex extremely important. I have seen in my country, I'm Dutch, that we started about 15 years ago a program that everyone uh, who is entering into university or another form of higher education uh, has as part as its uh, uh, financial scheme as a student an, uh, a travel card for all means of public transport. As a consequence, they use public transport uh, the number of people having a driver license has dropped and uh, uh, many of them don't have a car and they go on behaving that way so because they have a, a different uh, kind of lifestyle. Second thing, uh, yesterday uh, we have been able to award uh, some, 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 some agencies with prices. All the awards were on quality and on information technology. Very interesting to see that even in deregulated UK, a system, fast track, uh, a quality contract between the local authority and the private operator provides households living next to the system uh, with an electronic device which enables them to, uh, to, to see when buses are leaving in real time. And it affects the modal choice. So I think changes are underway. Indeed, the, the power of the app on the smartphone now on that is uh, really quite profound. I have a 23-year-old son. He has no interest in driving a car. He's exactly as you portray uh, in the Netherlands. Tony, just before we go to coffee, I realize we've left a lot of things, issues hanging still, and government particularly, I think the role of government, picking up on what John has told us this morning and the very sharp uh, observations he's made, I think that's where we're going to move probably in the second um, session. But uh, just your reflections on what we have and have not done in the last hour? Well, for, for me, uh, the, the really important extra message coming out of this session has been the role of transport and society. And, and that's important particularly given that that's the focus of next year's forum, as Jack has said. Three issues. First of all, society as a source of innovation. And, and, and the idea, as Scott Belcher uh, talked about of crowdsourcing and, and, and we had a wonderful example of that last night with our 17 year old uh, Korean uh, who came here to demonstrate what he himself had achieved uh, secondly the role of behavioural change and a number of the panel have mentioned importance of this there's a great tendency to think that technology can solve everything and that once it's solved all it can you look for behavioural change actually if you use technology and behavioural change together you achieve far more. And that comes back, I think, at the end to John's nice reference to dysfunctional consumers. In, in, in my feeling, consumers are dysfunctional because they're sent the wrong signals. And if consumers and government can work together to get the, the signals right, and you get involved governance rather than um, uh, hand, uh, arm's length governance, you, you'll uh, achieve great improvements. And, and one element of that is the price signal. 
Uh, and if I have one issue with what John was saying, uh, I, I don't think road tolls are a way of collecting revenue. They are a critical way of encouraging consumers to use our networks efficiently. And that's the way we need to use them, and that's the way in which we need to send signals to consumers generally. Tony, thank you. Um, I'm going to be quite brisk. We are five minutes over before coffee. Uh, thank you very much for, for summarizing what we have and have not done so far. John, thank you as well uh, for leaving us, particularly with your last few words of change on an unimaginable scale, and that being the message from the emerging world at the moment. So, Scott, uh, Jean-Pierre, John, and Hans, thank you very much indeed. We are, though, very much going to continue the spirit of this conversation and the content after coffee. We'll resume in 25 minutes. The bells will go please return on time and then we can uh, pick up with the same kind of um, intentions. Thank you very much indeed.